Chapter One of Aunt Judy's Tales by Mrs. Alfred Gaddy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Aunt Judy's Tales by Mrs. Alfred Gaddy by Margaret Gaddy. The Little Victims. Save our blessings, Master, save from the blight of thankless eye. Lyra in Ascentium. There is not a more charming sight in the domestic world than that of an elder girl in a large family, amusing what are called the little ones. How could Mamma have ventured upon that cosy nap in the armchair by the fire if she had been harassed by wondering what the children were about, whereas, as it was, she had overheard number eight begging the one they all called Aunt Judy to come and tell them a story, and she had beheld Aunt Judy's nod of consent whereupon she had shut her eyes and composed herself to sleep quite complacently under the pleasant conviction that all things were sure to be in a state of peace and security so long as the children were listening to one of those curious stories of aunt judy's in which with so much drollery and amusement there was sure to be mixed up some odd scraps of information or bits of good advice so mamma being asleep on one side of the fire and papa reading the newspaper on the other aunt judy and number eight noiselessly left the room and repaired to the large red curtained dining room where the former sat down to concoct her story while the latter ran off to collect the little ones together in less than five minutes time there was a stream of noise along the passage a bursting open of the door and a crowding round the fire by which aunt judy sat the little ones had arrived in full force and high expectation we will not venture to state their number. An order from Aunt Judy that they should take their seats quietly was but imperfectly obeyed, and a certain amount of hustling and grumbling ensued, which betrayed a rather quarrelsome tendency. At last, however, the large circle was formed, and the bright firelight danced over sunny curls and eager faces. Aunt Judy glanced her eye around the group, but whatever her opinion as an artist might have been of its general beauty, she was by no means satisfied with the result of her inspection. Number six and number seven, cried she, you are not fit to listen to a story at present. You have come with dirty hands. Number six frowned, and number seven broke out at once into a howl. He had washed his hands ever so short a time ago, and had done nothing since but play at knucklebones on the floor. Surely people needn't wash their hands every ten minutes. It was very hard aunt judy had rather a logical turn of mind so she set about expounding to the little ones in general and to numbers six and seven in particular that the proper time for washing people's hands was when their hands were dirty no matter how lately the operation had been performed before such at least she said was the custom in england and every one ought to be proud of belonging to so clean and respectable a country she therefore insisted that numbers six and seven should retire upstairs and perform the necessary ablution, or otherwise they would be turned out and not allowed to listen to the story. Numbers six and seven were rather restive. The truth was, it had been one of those unlucky days which now and then will occur in families, in which everything seemed to be perverse and go askew. It was a dark, cold, rainy day in November, and going out had been impossible. The elder boys had worried, and the younger ones had cried. It was Saturday, too, and the maids were scouring in all directions, waking every echo in the back premises by the grating of sandstone on the flags, and they had been a good deal discomposed by the family effort to play at wolf in the passages. Mamma had been at accounts all the morning, trying to find out some magical corner in which expenses could be reduced between then and the arrival of Christmas bills and moreover it was a half-holiday and the children had as they call it nothing to do so numbers six and seven who had been vexed about several other little matters before during the course of the day broke out now on the subject of the washing of their hands aunt judy was inexorable however inexorable though cool and the rest got impatient at the delay which the debate occasioned so partly by coaxing 
and partly by the threat of being shut out from hearing the story number six and seven were at last prevailed upon to go upstairs and wash their grim little paws into that delicate shell-like pink which is the characteristic of juvenile fingers when clean as they went out however they murmured in whimpered tones that they were sure it was very hard after their departure aunt judy requested the rest not to talk and a complete silence ensued during which one or two of the youngest evidently concluded that she was composing her story for they stared at her with all their might as if to discover how she did it meantime the rain beat violently against the panes and the red curtains swayed to and fro from the effect of the wind which in spite of tolerable woodwork found its way through the divisions of the windows there was something very dreary in the sound and very odd in the varying shades of red which appeared upon the curtains as they swerved backwards and forwards in the firelight several of the children observed it but no one spoke until the footsteps of numbers six and seven were heard approaching the door on which a little girl ventured to whisper i'm very glad i'm not out in the wind and rain and a boy made answer why who would be so silly as to think of going out in the wind and rain nobody of course at that moment number six and seven entered and took their places on two little derby chairs having previously showed their pink hands in sombre silence to aunt judy whereupon aunt judy turned herself so as to face the whole group and then began her story as follows there were once upon a time eight little victims who were shut up in a large stone building where they were watched night and day by a set of huge grown-up keepers who made them do whatever they chose don't make it too sad aunt judy murmured number eight half in a tremble already you needn't be frightened number eight was the answer my stories always end well i'm so glad chuckled number eight with a grin as he clapped one little fat hand down upon the other on his lap in complete satisfaction go on please was the large stone building a prison aunt judy inquired number seven that depends upon your ideas of a prison answered aunt judy what do you suppose a prison is oh a great big place with walls all around where people are locked up and can't go in and out as they choose very well that i think you may be allowed to call the place in which the little victims were kept a prison for it certainly was a great big place with walls all round and they were locked up at night and not allowed to go in and out as they chose poor things murmured number eight but he consoled himself by recollecting that the story was to end well aunt judy before you go on do tell us what victims are are they fairies or what i don't know this was the request of number five who was rather more thoughtful than the rest and was apt now and then to delay a story by his inquiring turn of mind number six was in a hurry to hear some more and nudged number five to make him be quiet but aunt judy interposed said she did not like to tell stories to people who didn't care to know what they meant and declared that number five was quite right in asking what a victim was a victim said she was the creature which the old heathens used to offer up as a sacrifice after they had gained a victory in battle you all remember i dare say continued she what a sacrifice is and have heard about abel's sacrifice to the firstlings of his flock the children nodded assent and aunt judy went on no such sacrifices are ever offered up now by us christians and so there are no more real victims now but we still use the word and call any creature a victim who is ill-used or hurt or destroyed by somebody else if you any of you were to worry or kill the cat for instance then the cat would be called the victim of your cruelty and in the same manner the eight little victims i am going to tell you about were the victims of the whims and cruel prejudices of those who had the charge of them and now before i proceed any further i am going to establish a rule that whenever i tell you anything very sad about the little victims you shall all of you groan aloud together so groan here if you please now that you quite understand what a victim is 
Aunt Judy glanced round the circle, and they all groaned together to order, led off by numbers three and four, who did not, it must be owned, look in a very mournful state while they performed the ceremony. It was wonderful what good that groan did them all. It seemed to clear off half the troubles of the day, and at its conclusion a smile was visible on every face. Aunt Judy then proceeded. I do not want to make you cry too much, but I will tell you of the miseries the captive victims underwent in the course of one single day, and then you will be able to judge for yourselves what a life they led together. One of their heaviest miseries happened every evening. It was the misery of going to bed. Perhaps now you may think it sounds odd that going to bed should be called a misery, but you shall hear how it was. In the evening, when all the doors were safely locked and bolted, so that no one could get away, the little victims were summoned downstairs and brought into a room where some of the keepers were sure to be sitting in the greatest luxury. There was generally a warm fire on the hearth and a beautiful lamp on the table, which shed an agreeable light around and made everything look so pretty and gay. The hearts of the poor, innocent victims always rose at the sight. Sometimes there would be a huge visitor or two present, who would now and then take the victims on their knees and say all manner of entertaining things to them, or there would be nice games for them to play at, or the keepers themselves would kiss them and call them kind names as if they really loved them. How nice all this sounds, does it not? And it would have been nice if the keepers would but have let it last forever. But that was just the one thing they never would do, and the consequence was that, whatever pleasure they might have had, the wretched victims always ended up being dissatisfied and sad. And how could it be otherwise? Just when they were at the height of enjoyment, just when everything was most delightful, a horrible knock was sure to be heard at the door, the meaning of which they all knew but too well. It was the knock which summoned them to bed, and at such a moment you cannot wonder that going to bed was felt to be a misfortune. Had there been a single one among them who was sleepy, or tired, or ready for bed, there would have been some excuse for the keepers. But as it was, there was none, for the little victims never knew what it was to feel tired or weary on those occasions, and were always carried forcibly away before that feeling came on. Of course, when the knock was heard, they would begin to cry and say that it was very hard, and that they didn't want to go to bed, and one went so far once as to add that she wouldn't go to bed. But it was all in vain. The little victims might as well have attempted to melt a stone wall as those hard-hearted beings who had the charge of them. And now, my dears, observed Aunt Judy, stopping in her account, this is, of all others, the exact moment at which you ought to show your sympathy with the sufferers, and groan. The little ones groaned accordingly, but in a very feeble manner. Aunt Judy shook her head. That groan is not half hearty enough for such a misery. Don't you think, if you tried hard, you could groan a little louder? They did try, and succeeded a little better, but cast furtive glances at each other immediately after. Were the beds very uncomfortable ones, Aunt Judy? inquired number eight, in a subdued voice. You shall judge for yourself, was the answer. They were raised off the floor upon legs so that no wind from under the door could get at them, and on the flat bottom called the bedstock there was placed a thick strong bag called a mattress, which was stuffed with some soft material which made it springy and pleasant to touch or lie down upon. The shape of it was a long square, or what may be called a rectangular parallelogram. I strongly advise you all to learn that word, for it is rather an amusing idea as one steps into bed to think that one is going to sleep upon a parallelogram. Numbers three and four were here unable to contain themselves, but broke into a peal of laughter. The little ones stared. Well, resumed Aunt Judy, for my part, I think it's a very nice thing to learn the ins and outs of one's own life, to consider how one's bed is made, and the why and wherefore of its shape and position. It is a great pity to get so accustomed to things as not to know their value till we lose them. But to proceed. On the top of this parallelogrammatic mattress 
was laid a soft blanket. On the top of that blanket, two white sheets. On the top of the sheets, two or more warm blankets, and on the top of the blankets, a spotted cover called a counterpane. Now it was between the sheets that each little victim was laid, as such were the receptacles to which they were unwillingly consigned, night after night of their lives. But I have not yet told you half the troubles of this dreadful going to bed. A good fire with a large tub before it, and towels hung over the fender, was always the first sight which met the tearful eyes of the little victims as they entered the nursery after being torn from the joys of the room downstairs. And then, lo and behold, a new misery began, for, whether owing to the fatigue of getting upstairs, or that their feelings had been so much hurt, they generally discovered at this moment that they were one and all so excessively tired they didn't know what to do, of all things did not choose to be washed, and insisted, each of them, on being put to bed first. But let them say what they would, and cry afresh as they pleased, and even snap and snarl at each other like so many small terriers, those cruel keepers of theirs never would grant their requests, never would put any of them to bed dirty, and always declared that it was impossible to put each of them to bed first. Imagine now the feelings of those who had to wait round the fire while the others were attended to, Imagine the weariness, the disgust, before the whole party was finished and put by for the night. Aunt Judy paused, but no one spoke. What? cried she suddenly. Will nobody groan? That I must groan myself. Which she did, and a most unearthly noise she made, so much so, that two or three of the little ones turned round to look at the swelling red curtains just to make sure the howl did not proceed from thence. After which Aunt Judy continued her tale. So much for night and going to bed, about which there is nothing more to relate, as little victims were uncommonly good sleepers, and seldom awoke till long after daylight. Well now, what do you think? By the time they had had a good night, they felt so comfortable in their beds that they were quite contented to remain there. And then, of course, their tormentors never rested till they had forced them to get up. Poor little things! Just think of their being made to go to bed at night, when they most disliked it, and then made to get up in the morning when they wanted to stay in bed. It certainly was, as they always said, very, very hard. This was, of course, a winter misery, when the air was so frosty and cold that it was very unpleasant to jump out into it from a warm nest. Terrible scenes took place on these occasions, I assure you, for sometimes the wretched victims would sit shivering on the floor, crying over their socks and shoes instead of putting them on, which they had no spirit for, and then the savage creatures who managed them would insult them by irritating speeches. Come, Miss So-and-so, one would say, don't sit fretting there. There's a warm fire and a nice basin of bread and milk waiting for you, if you will only be quick and get ready. Get ready. A nice order indeed. It meant that they must wash themselves and be dressed before they would be allowed to touch a morsel of food. But it is of no use dwelling on the unfeelingness of those keepers. One day one of them actually said, If you knew what it was to have to get up without a fire to come to, and without a breakfast to eat, you would leave off grumbling at nothing. Nothing, they called it. Nothing to have to get out of a warm bed into the fresh morning air and dress before breakfast. Well, my dears, pursued Aunt Judy, after waiting here a few seconds to see if anyone would groan. I shall take it for granted you feel for the getting up misery as well as the going to bed one, although you have not groaned as I expected. I'll just add, in conclusion, that the summer getting up misery was just the reverse of this winter one. Then the poor little wretches were expected to wait till their nursery was dusted and swept, so there they had to lie, sometimes for half an hour, with the sun shining in upon them, not allowed to get up and come out into the dirt and dust. Of course, on those occasions they had nothing to do but squabble among themselves and tease, and I assure you they had every now and then a very pleasant little revenge on their keepers, for they half worried them out of their lives by disturbances and complaints, and at any rate that was some comfort to them, although very often it hindered the nursery from being done half as soon as it would have been if they had been quiet. 
I shall not have time to tell of everything, continued Aunt Judy, so we must hurry over the breakfast, although the keepers contrived to make even that miserable, by doing all they could to prevent the little victims from spilling their food on the table and floor, and also by insisting on the poor little things sitting tolerably upright on their seats, not lolling with both elbows on the tablecloth, not making a mess, not, in short, playing any of those innocent little pranks in which young creatures take delight. It was a pitiable spectacle, as you may suppose, to see reasonable beings constrained against their inclinations to sit quietly while they ate their hearty morning meal, which really, perhaps, they might have enjoyed had they been allowed to amuse themselves in their own fashion at the same time. But I must go on now to that great misery of the day, which I shall call the lesson misery. Now you must know, the little victims were all born, as young kids, lambs, kittens, and puppy dogs are, with a decided liking for jumping about and playing all day long. Think, therefore, what their sufferings were when they were placed in chairs round a table, and obliged to sit and stare at queer-looking characters in books, until they had learned to know them what was called by heart. It was a very odd way of describing it, for I am sure they had often no heart in the matter, unless it was a hearty dislike. "'Tommy Brown in the village never learns any lessons,' cried one of them, once the creature who was teaching him. "'Why should I? He's always playing at oyster dishes in the gutter when I see him, and enjoying himself. I wish I might enjoy myself.' "'Poor victim!' He little thought what a tiresome lecture this clever remark of his would bring on his devoted head. Don't ask me to repeat it. It amounted merely to this, that twenty years hence he would be very glad he had learned something else besides oyster dishes in the streets, as if that signified to him now, as if it took away the nuisance of having to learn at the present moment to be told it would be of use hereafter. What was the use of its being of use by and by? so thought the little victim young as he was so said he in a muttering voice i don't care about twenty years hence i want to be happy now this was unanswerable as you may suppose so the puzzled teacher didn't attempt to make a reply but said go on with your lessons you foolish little boy see what it is to be obstinate pursued aunt judy See how it blinds people's eyes, and prevents them from knowing right from wrong. Pray take warning, and never be obstinate yourselves, and meantime let us have a good hearty groan for the lesson misery. The little ones obeyed, and breathed out a groan that seemed to come from the very depths of their hearts. But somehow or other, as the story proceeded, the faces looked rather less amused and rather more anxious than at first. What could the little ones be thinking about to make them grave? It was evidently quite a relief when Aunt Judy went on. You will be very much surprised, I dare say, said she, to hear of the next misery I am going to tell you about. It may be called the dinner misery, and the little victims underwent it every day. Did they give them nasty things to eat, Aunt Judy? murmured number eight very anxiously. More likely not half enough, suggested number five. But you promised not to make the story too sad, remember, observed number six. I did, replied Aunt Judy, and the dinner misery did not consist in nasty food, or there not being enough. They had plenty to eat, I assure you, and everything was good. But... Aunt Judy stopped short, and glanced at each of the little ones in succession. Make haste, Aunt Judy, cried number eight. But what? But, resumed Aunt Judy, in her most impressive tone, they had to wait between the courses. Again Aunt Judy paused, and there was a looking hither and thither among the little ones, and a shuffling about on the small derby chairs, while one or two pairs of eyes were suddenly turned to the fire, as if watching it relieved a certain degree of embarrassment which their owners began to experience. It is not every little boy or girl, was Aunt Judy's next remark, who knows what the courses of a dinner are. I don't, interposed number eight, in a distressed voice, as if he had been deeply injured. Oh, you think not? Well, not by name, perhaps, answered Aunt Judy. 
but I will explain. The courses of a dinner are the different sorts of food, which follow each other one after the other, till dinner is what people call over. Thus, supposing a dinner was to begin with pea soup, as you have sometimes seen it do, you'd expect when it was taken away to see some meat put upon the table, should you not? The little ones nodded assent. And after the meat was gone, you'd expect pie or pudding, eh? They nodded assent again, and with a smile. And if after the pudding was carried away, you saw some cheese and celery arrive, it would not startle you very much, would it? The little ones did nothing but laugh. Very well, pursued Aunt Judy, such a dinner as we have been talking about consists of four courses. The soup course, the meat course, the pudding course, and the cheese course. And it was while one course was being carried out, and another fetched in, that the little victims had to wait. And that was the dinner misery I spoke about, and a very grievous affair it was. Sometimes they had actually to wait several minutes, with nothing to do but to fidget on their chairs, lean backwards till they toppled over, or forward till some accident occurred at the table. And then, poor little things, if they ventured to get out their knuckle-bones for a game, or took to a little boxing amusement among themselves, or to throwing the salt in each other's mugs, or pelting each other with bits of bread, or anything nice and entertaining, down came those merciless keepers on their innocent mirth, and the old stupid order went round for sitting upright and quiet. Nothing that I can say about it would be half as expressive as what the little victims used to say themselves. They said that it was so very hard. Now then, a good groan for the dinner misery, exclaimed Aunt Judy in conclusion. The order was obeyed, but somewhat reluctantly, and then Aunt Judy proceeded with her tale. On one occasion of the dinner misery, resumed she, there happened to be a stranger lady present, who seemed to be very much shocked by what the victims had to undergo, and to pity them very much. So she said that she would set them a nice little puzzle, to amuse them till the second course arrived. But now, what do you think the puzzle was? It was a question, and this was it. Which is the harder thing to bear? To have to wait for your dinner, or to have no dinner to wait for? I do not think the little victims would have quite known what the stranger lady meant if she had not explained herself, for you see they had never gone without dinner in their lives, so they had not an idea what sort of a feeling it was to have no dinner to wait for. But she went on to tell them what it was like as well as she could. She described to them little Tommy Brown, whom they envied so much for having no lessons to do eating his potato soaked in the dripping begged at the squire's back door, without anything else to wait or hope for. She told them that he was never teased as to how he sat, or even whether he sat or stood, and then she asked them if they did not think he was a very happy little boy. He had no trouble or bother, but just ate his rough morsel in any way he pleased, and then was off, hungry or not hungry, into the streets again. To tell you the truth, pursued Aunt Judy, the victims did not know what to say to the lady's account of little Tommy Brown's happiness. But as the roast meat came in just as it concluded, perhaps that diverted their attention. However, after they had all been helped, it was suddenly observed that one of them would not begin to eat. He sat with his head bent over his plate, and his cheeks growing redder and redder, till at last someone asked what was amiss, and why he would not go on with his dinner on which he sobbed out that he had much rather it was taken to little Tommy Brown. "'That was a very good little victim, wasn't he?' asked number eight. "'But what did the keepers say?' inquired number five, rather anxiously. "'Oh,' replied Aunt Judy, "'it was soon settled that Tommy Brown was to have the dinner, which made the little victim so happy he actually jumped for joy.' on which the stranger lady told them she hoped they would henceforth always ask themselves a curious question whenever they sat down to a good meal again. For, said she, my dears, it will teach you to be thankful, and you may take my word for it, it is always the ungrateful people who are the most miserable ones. Oh, Aunt Judy, here interposed number six, somewhat vehemently, you need not tell any more. I know you mean us by the little victims. But you don't think we really mean to be ungrateful about the beds, or the dinners, or anything, do you? 
there was a melancholy earnestness in the tone of the inquiry which rather grieved aunt judy for she knew it was not well to magnify childish faults into too great importance so she took number six on her knee and assured her she never imagined such a thing as their being really ungrateful for a moment if she had she added she should not have turned their little ways into fun as she had done in the story number six was comforted somewhat on hearing this but still leaned her head on aunt judy's shoulder in a rather pensive state i wonder what makes one so tiresome mused the meditative number five trying to view the matter quite abstractly as if he himself was in no way concerned in it thoughtlessness only replied aunt judy smiling i have often heard mamma say it is not ingratitude in children when they don't think about the comforts they enjoy every day because the comforts seem to them to come like air and sunshine as a mere matter of course really exclaimed number six in a quite hopeful tone does mamma really say that yes but then you know continued aunt judy everybody has to be taught to think by degrees and then they get to know that no comforts ever do really come to anybody as a matter of course no not even air and sunshine but every one of them as blessings permitted by god and which therefore we have to be thankful for so you see we have to learn to be thankful as we have to learn everything else and mamma says it is a lesson that never ends even for grown-up people and now you understand number six that you oh i beg pardon i mean the little victims were not really ungrateful but only thoughtless and the wonderful stranger lady did something to cure them of that and in fact proved a sort of aunt judy to them for she explained things in such a very entertaining manner that they actually began to think the matter over and then they left off being stupid and unthankful but this reminds me added aunt judy that you tiresome number six have spoilt my story after all i had not half got to the end of the miseries for instance there was the taking care misery in consequence of which the little victims were sent out to play on a fine day and kept in when it was stormy and wet all because the stupid keepers were more anxious to keep them well in health than to please them at the moment and then there was above all here aunt judy became very impressive the washing misery which consisted in their being obliged to make themselves clean and comfortable with soap and water whenever they happened to be dirty whether with playing at knuckle-bones on the floor or anything else and which was considered so hard that but here a small hand was laid on aunt judy's mouth and a gentle voice said stop aunt judy now on which the rest shouted stop stop we won't hear any more in chorus until all at once in the midst of the din there sounded outside the door the ominous knocking which announced the hour of repose to the juvenile branches of the family it was a well-known summons but on this occasion produced rather an unusual effect first there was a sudden profound silence and pause of several seconds then an interchange of glances among the little ones then a breaking out of involuntary smiles upon several young faces and at last a universal good night aunt judy very quietly and demurely spoken if the little victims were only here to see how you behave over the going to bed misery what a lesson it would be suggested aunt judy with a mischievous smile ah yes yes we know we know was the only reply and it came from number eight who took advantage of being the youngest to be more saucy than the rest aunt judy now led the little party into the drawing-room to bid their father and mother good night too and certainly when the door was opened and they saw how bright and cosy everything looked in the light of the fire and the lamps with mamma at the table wide awake and smiling they underwent a fearful twinge of the going to bed misery but they checked all expression of their feelings of course mamma asked what aunt judy's story had been about and heard and heard too number six's little trouble lest she should have been guilty of the sin of real ingratitude and of course mamma applauded aunt judy's explanation about the want of thought very much indeed but mamma said number six to her mother aunt judy said something about grown-up people having to learn to be thankful surely you and papa never cry for nonsense and things you can't have ah my darling number six cried mamma earnestly grown-up people may not 
cry for what they want exactly but they are just as apt to wish for what they cannot have as you little ones are for instance grown-up people would constantly like to have life made easier and more agreeable to them than god chooses it to be they would like to have a little more wealth perhaps or a little more health or a little more rest or that their children should always be good and clever and well and happy and while they are thinking and fretting about the things they want they forget to be thankful for those they have i am often tempted in this way myself dear number six so you see aunt judy is right and the lesson of learning to be thankful never ends even for grown-up people one other word before you go i dare say you little ones think we grown-up people are quite independent and can do just as we like but it is not so we have to learn to submit to the will of the great keeper of heaven and earth without understanding it just as aunt judy's little victims had to submit to their keepers without knowing why so thank aunt judy for her story and let us all do our best to be obedient and contented when i am old enough mother remarked number seven in his peculiarly mild and deliberate way of speaking and smiling all the time i think i shall put aunt judy into a story don't you think she would make a capital ogre's wife like the one in jack and the beanstalk who told jack how to behave and gave him good advice it was a difficult question to say no to so mamma kissed number seven instead of answering him and number seven smiled himself away with his head full of the bright idea end of the little victims recording by Aram lee